welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story has been a long time in the making, and one that I know you guys have been waiting with bated breath. It is with huge happiness and excitement that I welcome back our brother, Mr. David Holly, with a brand new creation that I'm sure you're set to sink your teeth into. Of course, as ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Dawson Nosferatu. Let's get straight into that. I found the girl's body in a ravine. She'd been raped. She'd been beautiful in life. Long, straight black hair. Her simple blouse had been torn off, exposing her soft round breast. Her long red skirt had also been torn from her body. Whoever had attacked the young woman was brutal and a killer. After raping her, it slit her throat. I made a mental note in my head that there was no blood on the ground around her. Whoever brutalized and murdered her must have killed her back up the trail and had watched her bleed out and then transported her body here. Still, I told myself, why would he have moved her body and torn her garments away from where she'd been killed? I took a shovel off my pack mule and dug a grave for the young Indian girl, wrapped her in a blanket, and gently lay her in her grave. I then filled the grave in, put a simple cross in the ground at the head of the grave and read over her. I didn't know her name, had no idea where she'd come from, but she at least had a Christian burial. My big grey gelding was poor in the ground, anxious to travel. Even the mule didn't like it here. I climbed into the saddle and started up the trail, while the chilly November wind roared through the trees. I'd been riding for four days and hadn't seen any sign of the gugwe or any other wolf-like creatures. Well, that was a good thing, but those bastards could appear any time. And the grey took me higher into the hills. I kept my right hand on my Colt forty-five peacemaker. The dead girl weighed heavily upon my mind. I found a spot to camp that night and set up camp. I built an allen just in case we'd get a shower. I built a small well, concealed campfire inside the shelter, fried some bacon and made a pot of coffee. And darkness enveloped the little parchment of woods I had camped in. The night was quiet. I used my cold peacemaker out, checked it out and lay it beside me. If anything disturbed my sleep, I was going to discover I had no humour being awakened in the middle of the night. My lazy eye, Rowdy, Nixon and Sherry have been gone for six months. Twice I had thought about joining them. My last letter from Rowdy had indicated Sherry was improving, but whatever that Wendigo had put into her head, it wasn't simply going to disappear. She had, Rowdy had written, began having dreams of unclean creatures and seeing me in mortal danger. Well, I thought as I read the letter, I've been in mortal danger most of my life, and I'd managed to stay alive. I drank one last cup of hot coffee and rolled up in my blankets, and sleep came, and I welcomed it. Chapter 1 I woke up shortly before sunrise and built my fire back up from the hot coals of my campfire. I did more water to the coffee and sliced myself more bacon and began frying it. I was headed farther north towards the Ozarks, when I was going to meet with Rowdy and Sherry. I sent word that maybe coming back home might be a good idea. The simple truth was, I missed her nagging, her smile, and the warmth which filled the house. I ate the crisp bacon and washed it down with a couple of cups of hot coffee, but it was time to move. I doused the fire with what remained of my coffee and sat on my horse and repacked the mule. And then I saw it. Tracks. A horse had been on the edge of my camp, and then had left, and I marveled that I hadn't heard it. Ah, Dawson, I said half aloud. Ah, you're getting old. I studied the tracks and saw the faint prints of a man's boot. Well, I didn't like that. A man riding so quietly, coming upon my camp, and with me not hearing horse or rider. I drew my forty-five peacemaker from its holster, checked its action, and mounted my horse. I surely was moving out. My eyes scanned the forest surrounding me. My morning was silent as the grave. 
I had other days begin like this, and they always ended badly. Now we made steady progress. I was never certain if I was in Kiyomichi Mountains, or I had started skirting the Wichita Mountains, or the Ozarks, but I was looking over some spectacular vistas. The leaves were starting to change colour. I was enamoured by the beauty of this range I'd found myself riding in. And I rode warily. From time to time I'd see what I assumed might have been a trapper's cabin in the distance, or I'd hear some chopping of wood. I thought I'd head in towards the sound of human companionship, but I'd change my mind and push on. My path dipped lower than I'd been riding. Northwest of me, there were clouds gathering. The wind had a cooler feel to it, and I saw the distant flash of lightning followed by the equally distant sound of thunder. I needed to find shelter, and give the horse and the mule a break. And a fry seemed to envelop me. It cast its silent spell upon me as I picked my way along my old fading game trail. I'd followed trails like this before. I was far away from my home and more familiar range. Nothing moved except the cool wind. I rounded a stand of ancient cedars and caught a quick glimpse of something big crashing through the brush. My horse shied away from whatever it was, and my mule stopped dead in its tracks. I shucked my rifle from its boot, chambered around and waited. Bear, or something else. My ears strained to catch any sound, but only the limbs rubbing on one another in the breeze could be all that I heard. My eyes searched the deeper timber, and I couldn't see any danger, but I knew I felt eyes watching my next move. The sound of approaching thunder reminded me Indeed, I needed to find some shelter. I hadn't forgotten my unseen and unheard night rider from the previous night, and best I thought to stick to the task at hand. Shelter, a warm fire, and hot coffee. Chapter 2 Twenty minutes later, I came across the remains of what had once been a cabin. The roof looked solid enough, and the walls of chunks of wood missing, but it would keep the cold out. I stuck my head inside, let my eyes adjust to the darkness, and let both the horse and the mule inside. It was what remained of a fireplace, a small pile of wood which lay close at hand. I built a fire and unsaddled my horse and removed the pack off the mule. Then I rubbed both down and gave them some grain. I rummaged through my gear, produced a candle, lit it, and looked around my shelter. What I would do, I told myself. I sliced more bacon put coffee on and found what was left of a loaf of bread. I was going to eat good tonight. And then my horse snorted, and I saw a tall man dressed in black standing just outside the cabin door. He removed his hat and smiled. Ah, sorry for startling you, amigo. I don't like being startled. Evening. Won't you come in out the rain? Ah, thank you, stranger. He said as he crossed into the room, hat in hand. I appreciate the invitation. I see you're preparing your evening meal. I have plenty. Enjoy me? I asked. He declined and told me he didn't think he could eat anything. Just needed to get out of the rain. His horse was tied under the shelter of four big trees just outside. His name, he said, was Victor Rojas. I knew the name. Fast gun for hire. He usually worked farther west, but here he was sipping on a flask and watching me eat bread and bacon. He asked my name as I sat eating, and I replied, Morgan Dawson. Ah, the lawman, he said quietly. Ah, no longer. I gave that up. I heard it said that you were a man of peace, but didn't suffer bad behavior. And I've heard you appear and disappear like the mist, after your work is completed. Are you here for me? I have no interest in you, Dawson. If I had... Uh, you would have known it last night. Ah, uh, then you would have won inside my camp. <laughs> yes, I smelled your coffee, but by the time I arrived, you were sound asleep, so I rolled on. And there it was, a hired gunman I ridden quietly into my camp, spent time looking over me, and then rode away just as quietly as he had arrived. Now the wind continued to blow, the rain continued too. Rojas and I continued our visit, and he refused coffee and what bacon and bread left. He was just wanting to talk. He spent an hour with me. Then, as the rain stopped, he stood, hitched his twin coats up, and told me he'd enjoyed the visit and the hospitality, but he had to ride. I didn't ask him where he was headed. The man had a reputation. 
it was best to remain ignorant about where he might be headed. Best not to share my camp. His movements were fluid as he mounted his horse, turned towards me, head bowed low, raised his head, and said evenly, Dawson, there's a creature watching this cabin. I believe it intends to kill and eat you. Right quietly, compadre. Uh, thanks, Rojas. I owe you one. He touched the brim of his hat and moved off into the night. I managed to put a door of sorts up and made some more coffee and waited impatiently for dawn. Chapter 3 Let's get straight into that. An hour after full sunrise, I was back in the saddle, eyes sweeping the thick forest before and around me. If there was a creature of any sort trailing me, I was staying in a deep cover. The wildlife was abundant. I watched deer moving among oak trees, eating acorns. I was tempted to shoot one for the meat, but I wasn't sure what a shot would bring out of the brush. Victor Rojas had been a surprise showing up out of the darkness in a heavy thunderstorm. He was quiet and a spooky killer. No one really knew much about him, except he seemed to live a charmed life. Several claimed to have seen him hit solidly in shootouts, but he claimed the bullets tore his clothing and failed to hit him. I had never seen him in action, but his appearance in that old cabin during the storm had been unsettling. Still, I thought. He had told me he wasn't after me, and he did warn me that a creature was stoking me. And the mountain air was beginning to cool. I constantly watched the trees to my left and to my right, straight ahead, and I watched my back trail. And from time to time, I'd hear brush popping, and once I was sure, I heard a low, guttable growl off to my left. I had been in a saddle for hours. I needed a place to bed down for the night and a place where my horse and mule could be stripped and cared for. I was about to give up hope when I rounded a curve on the game trail I was riding on and came face to face with a little girl approximately eight years old. I had big brown eyes, they studied me. I tilted my hat back and grinned. Well, hello there, young lady, I said. Who are you and where are your folks? As she was measuring me up and down and sideways, she cleared her throat and said quietly, I'm Olivia. My grandpa, Ted and her family are camped through the trees, and she gestured at a thick stand of timber just behind her. Is that your horse? Well, he's big and pretty. I've never seen a grey horse with a black mane and tail before. I was about to thank her, but she wouldn't let me get a word in. Can I ride him? What's your name, mister? Are you an outlaw? Or just a no-account shirtless drifter? Uh, my name's Morgan. I guess you can say I'm a drifter. Uh, if you let me ride your horse, uh, I'll take you to our camp. Very suddenly, a bellowing roar shook the forest, and I climbed off my horse quickly picked the youngster up and told her to hang on to the saddle horn. Now my mule was some upset and wanted to be moving. I heard that roar before and I knew what it was. I climbed up behind Olivia and got Bango moving. We wound our way through the timber and soon emerged into a large, level clearing and with several wagons arranged in a semicircle in front of a large, rocky overhang. And there was a shout as several large men met us and I lowered Olivia to the ground. Go! The large man said as he dropped to his knees and wrapped his big arms around her. Where were you? Don't you know better than to wander off alone? I wasn't alone, Papa. Mr. Morgan was with me. His horse is called Bango. Ain't that funny? And a big man stood and offered his hand. His name was Ted Grady, and he had several cousins who'd found the spot and were planning on trying to settle in for the winter. Well, you heard that roar? We did. Heard it last two nights, too. Uh, do you have any idea of what it is? No. We know we weren't listening to a big cat. Uh, you can be sure it isn't a big cat. I looked at the setup of the camp over and asked if I could stable my horse and mule. The overhang was large enough to house the wagons, teams and riding stock. Well, there was enough room for Bango and my mule. And the Grady party had built a fire just inside the overhang and provided enough cover for the women, folk and children so that they could sleep warm and dry. The men of the camp had built lean-tos behind the barricade of wagons. I found a spot near Ted Grady and made myself a comfortable bed. I sat wiping my rifle off when one of the ladies announced that the evening meal was ready. I filled my plate with a stew that they had prepared and a couple of biscuits. Ted Grady filled a coffee cup for me and we settled down to eat. A 
while the night had become black. Clouds obscured the stars. A few lamps were lit, and I listened quietly to the friendly conversations as I sipped my coffee. I got up and was filling my coffee cup when one of the family called to me. Mr. Morgan? A cold, emotionless voice spoke from the far side of the wagons. His name isn't Mr. Morgan, it's Morgan Dawson. I dropped my coffee cup and spun towards the voice, my cold forty-five peacemaker in hand. I spotted Victor Rojas sitting in the saddle on his black stallion. Oh, Rojas, I began. Oh, you got a bad habit of coming into the camp with no notice. I could have killed you. My apologies, Dawson. I was beginning to snow and I saw your fire. You want to step down and come on this side of the wagons and warm yourself? Asked Grady. Rojas smiled and my imagination must have been working overtime, for I was sure Rojas had sharp canine teeth. Rojas tipped his hat and declined the invitation to warm. He was happiest in the cold weather. He looked past the Grady family and spoke to me. The air creature's squatting in a timberline waiting for your fire to burn low. And when it does, and you're at the height of your exhaustion, they will come. Well, stay and help us fight, I said. Nope, I can't. I have to leave. Good luck, folks. You have to leave. Your gun could help save a lot of these people. And Rojas began to back his horse up. The big black stallion snorted, and Rojas touched the brim of his hat. Good luck, Dawson. He started to spur his mount when I said, How many are there? And how can you ride through them unmolested? Good luck. He rode away into the blowing snow. I looked at Grady and suggested he move everyone deeper. Under the overhang, it was about to get real here. Chapter 5 The adults began bunching their teams closer together, mine included, and began moving the sleeping children farther back into the overhang. A new, bigger fire was started. Mothers moved around their children as to protect them. All carried a gun of some sort. And the adult man began stacking wood crates and barrels in front of the entrance. No one was talking. An attack was coming, and no one felt like sleeping. And Ted Grady sat near the fire, sipping his coffee. He was no pilgrim. He never looked into the fire. I had an idea I should know him from somewhere, but I figured if he wanted to talk about his past, well, we had all winter. If we survived this night. Morgan Dawson, I have heard of you. Never in a hundred years did I ever think our paths would cross. I didn't say anything. I let him talk. I met Dutch Anglin down in Texas a few years ago. I was a sheriff over in Boston, Texas. Ah, you're that Ted Grady. Dutch speaks highly of you, Mr. Ted. I wish he was here with us. Huh. Me too. Ah, this fellow that was here, you know him? Ah, only by his reputation. Victor Rojas. That was Rojas? Was he as good as they say? I didn't know how to respond. I suspect he is. Now the falling snowfall and frigid north wind made it impossible to see or hear until the creatures were only yards away from the wagon barricade. A rifle cracked and one of the beasts I recognised as a gugway screamed and clutched its throat. I had him fired and a second shot echoed. The gugway were then confused. And then I saw him standing openly on the ice-covered boulder, firing into the gugway. It was Rojas. I began firing my weapon, as did Ted Grady. And we drove the gugway back, but it came again. Twice they came back. Rojas continued to assist us from above with his rifle. The gugway seemed to be growing in numbers, and I was sure we weren't going to see Christmas this year. Thunder rolled through the Kiermichi Mountains, and a brilliant flash of lightning revealed the putrid horror gathering for the final attack upon us. The good way roared, and these roars were answered by roars equally horrific. Ted graded and looked in my direction. Wolves, and other kinds you know about. These, uh, they're different. How different? They're bipedal, eight feet tall and meaner than rattlesnakes. Don't be shocked at what you see. I'm happy to see you people are fighters. And the cool, even voice came from behind us. Both of us turned and Rojas was standing behind us. Where did you come from, Rojas? I was sure he hadn't just walked in. 
He was smooth. I had a senator Rux. I'm afraid I move about as silently as a can. Occupational issue for one in my profession. I'm sure you understand, Dawson. I understood all right. Many a time while working as a deputy United States Marshal, my safety had depended upon how quietly I could move around. But Rojas, it was a different matter, however. He was just plain scary in his ability to suddenly appear. As a matter of fact, his big horse was awfully quiet too. I began hearing growls moving through the darkness, moving towards the barricade. Rojas moved up beside me and stared into the darkness. He whistled lightly as a good way stepped forward from the total darkness. I fired my forty five seventy, aiming for the creature's eye socket. The creature screamed and pitched forward, and Rojas smiled. Excellent shot, Dawson. A forty five seventy, I see. Well, I guess the job done, I replied. Yes, he replied and showed me his own rifle. I also used the caliber. There was an earth-shattering roar and Goodway poured out of the timber. There was no way I thought that we were going to survive this attack. Rojas whistled shrilly, and the huge man wolves began attacking the Goodway. I raised my rifle, but Rojas took the end of my barrel and lowered it. I know my eyes were ablaze with fury. Rojas! And he smiled and simply said, Wait, children of the night, Dawson. What music they make? You call this? I shouted. Music? They came to protect you and your friends. He smiled again, and it was not warm nor friendly. His smile looked wicked, sinister. His black-gloved hand patted me on my shoulder, and I suppressed a shudder. It was all I could do to keep from screaming. Chapter 6 Let's get straight into that. Sometime before dawn, Victor Rojas disappeared. It wasn't surprising to me, for he was a strange character, appearing and disappearing at will. The night was still black and the air cold. No one could recall him leaving. And I was beside myself, but why should I have expected a cold-blooded hide gun to hang around? Tim brought me a cup of coffee, and I stood contemplating Rojas. Maybe he was simply repaying a lot of outstanding debts, Tim said. Hmm, maybe... Well, there were no more attacks that night, and when dawn broke, I was started to see there were no bodies lying about. But there should have been bodies, and I pointed this out to the adults. Perhaps, the majority said, their bodies had been removed under the cover of total darkness and snow flurries. Maybe the wolves had taken them. A plausible explanation, even though no wolves were actually seen. Olivia was standing in a wagon and pointed towards the south. Grandpa! Rad is coming. I made sure my rifle was loaded and the pistol could be drawn smoothly. The three riders reined up. I found myself grinning like a kid in a candy shop. Dutch Anglin stood in his stirrups looking around. Morning, Morg. Nice spot you got here. Huh. Not mine, Dutch. It's the Grady settlement. Grady? Tim Grady? And Tim moved up beside me. Hello, Dutch. Good to see you and your friends. Climb down and have something to eat. Grandpa, do you know this shirtless drifter? And Dutch started laughing, climbed out of his saddle and walked over to Olivia as she stood in the back of the wagon. Ah, your grandpa knows me, hon. I used to be his deputy back in Texas. Olivia, you know the stories I've told you about Mr. Dutch Anglin? Yes, sir. This... He gestured to Dutch. This is Dutch Anglin. I live his mouth dropped open. Please don't shoot me, Mr. Anglin. I'm real sorry I called you my shirt, this drifter. Your horse is pretty. Can I ride him? Well, you can ride mine, sweetheart. And the second rider was of slight build. Olivia looked the rider over and asked, Who are you? You might be a shirtless, no account drift. Yeah. He might be ugly too. And the second rider lowered the scarf which had covered their face. I might be a no account shirtless drifter, but I'm also a girl. My name's Anne Harden. Well, little lady, I am a no account shirtless drifter. I had to grin as lazy eye rowdy Nicks enjoying the conversation. Miss Olivia, Ted, meet lazy eye rowdy Nixon, former army scout, tracker, Indian fighter, 
and Ranch Hand. Fought in the Lincoln County War. Former member of the French Foreign Legion. I looked over at Olivia. Her little mouth was hanging open in surprise. He just looks and acts like a no account shell the stressor. Several of the men took axes and saws and began cutting young trees and heaving them into the campsite where potholes had been dug and their beginnings overly extending from each side of the overhang extending to each side. A native rock was found loaded into a wagon and used to build a couple of proper fire pits. Wagons were turned over on their sides after being unloaded to create a front wall. Canvas was then stretched over. The open top was stretched beyond the overhang and by dark the place looked a bit more like a safe haven from the storm we knew was coming. Chapter 7 Ah, Victor Rojas. Hoped I'd never hear his name again. Dutch said. Saw him years ago in San Antonio. Killed three men in the middle of the street in the dark. Ah, he's a dangerous character, Morgan. A lazy I spat a stream of tobacco juice into the fire pit. I heard of him, Morgan. Moves about in silence. Does what he wants or is paid to do. Then disappears without a sound. Yeah, like a ghost, Anne said. Well, like a ghost, I echoed. Still, he did help put our fat out of the fire last night. And Tim Grady stood and picked up his rifle. I noticed and stood to my feet. We got company, Mr. Dawson. Uh, Rojas stood quietly, leaning against one of the wagons, we turned over. A strange smile was upon his lips. Good evening, good people. I see you've enlarged your sight, and you have more warriors joining you. That's good. Uh, join us by the fire. Have a cup of coffee. Thank you. The night grows colder, and I will be pleased to join you by the fire. However, I must decline the offer of a cup of coffee. Uh, you don't like coffee? Asked Nixon. I dislike the bitterness. Nixon spat a stream of tobacco juice into the fire. And he eyed Rojas closely. Why, they say you're fast. How fast are you, Vic? Nixon asked. Vic to senior. I dislike being called Vic. It breeds familiarity. When one is in my business, I have pays now to become overly familiar. Okay, so... He paused. You figure you're faster than Morgan. Dutch. Rojas lowered his head and stretched his hands out towards the fire. For a moment, Lazy Eye believed he was being ignored. I believe, Nixon, I'll be better than either Mr. Dawson or Mr. Anglin. Hmm. What do y'all think, fellas? You think he's faster than either one of y'all? I sat sipping my coffee and studied that visitor. Dutch cleared his throat. <clears throat> I saw you in action once. You good. Killed three men one night in a stand-up gunfight. I'm sure someday we'll have an answer to Mr. Nixon's question. Then we'll know the answer. The Dutch rose to his feet and told Anne he thought they needed to check the perimeter of the camp. Lazy Eye got up and spread a blanket near the fire and climbed onto the blanket and covered himself with a buffalo robe. Night, Morg. He eyed Rojas, whose back was to him. You have a good sleep, Mr. Rojas. He pulled his hat over his eyes and turned over onto his side, and was soon snoring. And Tim Grady excused himself and moved into the overhang, where Olivia lay sleeping. I lit a cigar of a Rojas one, which he turned down, and I studied him. You're not Mexican, are you, Rojas? Nope. My people came from Spain. Yours? Uh, northeast Texas. I've uh, never been in that part of the country. You have family there? Well, my family was killed by renegades and a ranch looted and burned to the ground. I got back the day before our neighbors buried my folks and brother and sister. Uh, you avenged them? Well, in a manner. I became a deputy United States Marshal. I spent ten years tracking them down. I arrested four of them and killed three of them. Well, I see. Well, it's good to know you have a strong will and a fast gun. Very good to know. Well, I didn't know it, but... Olivia was awake and whispered to her grandfather. Did you hear that, Grandpa? Mr. Dawson was a lawman. <laughs> I knew that, honey. He was a good lawman. Now try to get some sleep. Yes, sir, Grandpa. Grandpa? Yes, Olivia. That other man? 
Oh, he's a monster. Hush, child, before he hears you. Now the night was awfully still. The wind, of course, pushed through, blowing snow all around us. Rojas had stretched out in front of the overhang, wrapped only in a long, black overcoat he wore. I watched him lying on his back, his eyes closed, his breathing so light, I thought he wasn't breathing at all. Well, he was a strange man. Far in the distance, I heard the chilling roars of the Gugway, mingled with the howls of the wolf creatures. What had Rojas called them? Children of the night? Some children. At some point, I fell asleep, and what happened later, I found out about later, is what's called hearsay. Apparently, everyone was sleeping soundly. No one could remember even hearing anything. Olivia Grady was sleeping quietly when she felt the weight of someone leaning over her bedroll. The voice was filled with a malice and evil. You will forget what you told your grandfather about me, being a monster. I am of the undead child. Say nothing more if you value your grandfather and your friends. Do you understand me, child? I'm sure Olivia understood. She was an intelligent child. And sometime during a cold, snow-driven night, Rogers disappeared. I awoke with a start. It was still dark and snow was piling up. Four men I'd never seen were crouched over the fire, warming their hands. Lazy I was sitting up with his buffalo robe wrapped around his shoulders. He tossed a pebble towards me, thinking I should be awake. Right, a big man here says... He was here when he wrapped himself up in his bedding. We must be getting close, boys. He must be getting careless. Who are you boys talking about? Asked Lazy Eye. The three of them turned and eyed Lazy Eye Nixon. Calls himself Victor Rojas. Hired gun. He killed that boss three weeks ago. We're going to track him down, throw a rope around him and hang him. Without a proper trial. I asked as I now stood before them with my forty-five in hand. And who are you, mister? Morgan Dawson. Another hired gun. Rojas, a friend of yours. And a host of my 45. Uh, not especially. He helped us out the night before last. Showed up last night and sat by the fire. And when I turned in, he was stretching out near the entrance. Well, Pilgrim, he's not here now. Any idea where he disappeared to? Well, he was lying down near the entrance, wrapped in a big heavy coat, when I went to sleep. So... You're saying you don't have any idea where that killer went? Well, that's what I'm saying, stranger. And the man speaking for the stranger slowly stood up from the fire. I knew he wanted to dominate these folks. He snapped his fingers and his companions all stood with him. And they all threw their coats back, revealing the side arms. <sighs> I sighed and said, This doesn't have to go down this way, boys. I say you're lying, Dawson. I think you and Rojas are in business together. I say you're a four-flushing liar. And I say you boys need to ride on before I'm forced to kill you. You arrogant trash. His hand darted downwards to his pistol. His companions were grabbing theirs. In my hand, I was quicker. The pre-dawn silence was split when gunfire split the air. I emptied my forty-five, and the four men lay dead. I reloaded my pistol and looked around. And I saw fear etched in a few faces. Ah, <sighs> Rojas owes me now. Chapter 9 All we can tell you, Marg, is he never passed me or Anne. It wasn't that I didn't believe Dutch, but the killings had left a bad taste in my mouth. The four dead men had been searching for Rojas, not Dawson. I saddled Bango up and led him out of the shelter of the overhang. Olivia was staring at me. I had a feeling something was wrong. And as I climbed into the saddle, she walked up to Banjo and offered my big grey and black gelding a carrot, and I spoke to her. Olivia, is something bothering you, sweetie? Oh, she wouldn't look up at me, but I thought I knew what was wrong. How did me shooting those four men scare you? If it did, I'm sorry, but they were going to kill me. Uh, that's... that's not what bothering me, Mr. Morgan. Then what is? You can tell me. And she looked around studying every rock, every place from which a man or a woman could hide. That other man that was here early last night, he's... he's... A killer. Yes, I know. He's a monster, Mr. Morgan. A, a real monster. Uh, most high killers are, honey. 
No, he's a real monster. He told me if I told you, he would kill my grandpa, you, and everybody else. He said he was of the undead. Uh, what's undead? Undead? said Dutch as he walked up behind Olivia and put his big hands on her small shoulders. Ah, the Nosferatu. In layman's terms, he said quietly, and he told her, he is a vampire. And there it was, finally out in the open. I'd read enough penny dreadfuls to know a little bit about vampires. It made me feel queasy. No wonder he couldn't be killed in a gunfight. Always thought after the sun had gone down. But if the stories I'd read were remotely correct, he might damn well be immortal. And I rode out with my rifle at the ready. Rojas had threatened Olivia to keep her quiet. And I'd been forced into an unwanted gunfight with four men who were looking for Rojas, who had planned to kill him. Only thing was, neither they nor myself had known his true nature. And now I was searching for a creature who left precious little sign of what he was doing here in the Kiamichis, anyway. Well, at least I hadn't left the Grady party unprotected. Dutch, Anna and Rowdy were keeping an eye on the settlers. And Dutch was better educated than most. Anna was poison mean, which she had to be. Lazy eye. Or he paid his dues as a fighter all around the world. I thought about Tim Grady. He'd been a sheriff in some tough places. And now he was leading what family he had looking for a better life, away from guns, knives and such. Yeah, the settlers could make it okay, as long as Rojas and his children of the night didn't flank me and attacked while I was gone. Now, travelling through the snow is slow business. What was worse was, it was snowing again, and the wind was whipping all around me. I'd been searching for somewhere where Rojas might be resting. Some old trapper's cabin, maybe. And then I saw the dog creatures, moving up a slope, heading for what I believed was a cave system. Well, it made sense. He had to rest during the day. He had to be protected, and what better place to hide than a heart-defying cave? And who better to watch over him and protect him than werewolves and Gugway? And I headed Banjo back to camp, hoping to find everyone else alive. Chapter 10 I called out as I approached the camp. Lazy Eye told me to come on in. We had venison steaks, beans, cornbread and coffee. I climbed off Banjo and found willing hands to lead him to the back of the overhang and strip him and rob him down. It had been a long day. I was cold, and now the wind rose to a fever pitch. The snow was taking on blizzard proportions. Everyone was around the fire. I noticed several new faces which had stumbled in after I had ridden out during the morning. Two families of Choctaw. They provided the meat. Rowdy had wrapped his buffalo robe around Olivia, and no one was warm. Uh, did you find anything, Morgan? Anne asked. Uh, I think he's in a cave about an hour away from here. Saw some werewolves headed up a slope and they weren't hunting. I figured the wolves in the Gugway are they protecting him. Morgan, Dutch said as he took a drink of the hot coffee. Uh, closest place would be. And Dutch grinned. Camp angling on Crazy Woman Creek. I sent a letter asking for Brother Henry to bring help. We might just need his knowledge. Yep, Dutch. Lazy Eyes said. We might need a miracle or two also. I was bone tired and weary. After soughing down two venison steaks and drinking a second cup of coffee, I wrapped myself up near one of the fires and fell into a deep, uninterrupted sleep. A nightmare filled with werewolves, gugwe, and walking dead men. The nightmare had been so real. I even dreamed Rojas had knelt beside me and whispered an unintelligible language to me. And I awoke with a start. The wind was still. It had stopped snowing for a while. And the wagons were being loaded and I couldn't figure out why. Dutch stood in her stirrups of his saddle, moving up and down the line of wagons. and had given her horse up to Olivia, who was being led by her grandfather. Lazy Eye was sitting in his horse, watching the sky to the north of us. The Chottos were spaced out, weapons ready to fight. My horse Banjo and my supply mill were saddled and loaded. And Dutch shouted at me to get ready, and we had to move out. I got out of my bedroll. What's going on, Dutch? Big storm heading our way. We're headed for a cave about two hours away from here. Anne's driving Tim's wagon, lazy eyes right in point. We can't fight the weather and roll jazz, Morgan. I looked back to the north and I could have sworn I heard a voice commanding the elements. 
I hastily rolled my bedroll and tied it to my saddle, mounted Banjo and my leader mule, and I joined the caravan. Nan told one of the Choctaw to tie my mule to the back of her wagon, and that Mr. Dawson needed to have a free hand. Olivia waved to me, and I tipped my hat in acknowledgement, and then with Rowdy leading the way, we started out. Chapter 11 Let's get straight into that. We rode for over two hours before we arrived at the cave. It was large enough to pull wagons, stock and people inside. We brought a few poles from their old camp and we used these as firewood. Now the cave was large enough for wagons, livestock and families. I paced the interior of the cave, helping to build campfires, stacking wood and helping to build a barrier to keep the werewolves and Gugway out. I hoped Rojas wouldn't find us, but deep down I didn't really think we'd be able to escape. And I stood in the entrance of the cave, rifle in hand. What sunlight we had was now fading, and black clouds were beginning to obscure the moon. The wind was beginning to kick up again, and the snow was once more fallen. And we were all warm inside the cave. Lazy Eye and the Choctaws had cut pine and cedars and had covered the cave's entrance. Multiple fires had been built in the cave. Two torches had been lit, one for each side of the cave entrance. And two of the Choctaw offered to stand guard at the entrance. Anne and Lazy Eye would spell them during the night. And Rojas had Fred and Olivia and everyone else. I was partial to that child and I laid my bedroll down beside her. Tim, her grandfather, lay on the other side of her bed. Tim had placed his pistol under an old burlap bag filled with pine needles, which he used as a pillow. My forty-five lay under my quilt with easy access to it. A few times I heard the howls of the werewolves and the bellowing roars of the Gugwe. All were searching for us. I could imagine Victor Rojas on that black stallion of his sitting unperplexed on the wind-blown hill, listening and searching for us. The Dutch had made a couple of simple crosses and put them both just inside the cave entrance. Tim had prayed over them and hoped it would keep him at bay. I couldn't sleep, and so I sat up and braced my back against the saddle, pulled one of those penny dreadfuls out of my saddlebags and began reading. It had been a long time since all of this happened, and I don't remember the name of the story but it was about one of these undead, no account, shiftless vampires. After reading for about an hour, I closed my magazine and tried once more to get some sleep. Nothing happened that first night in the cave. It seemed to me that everyone was fine, refreshed and alert. Well, they were until the tracks made by Boots were seen just outside of the cave, and I studied the tracks. There was little doubt in my mind that Rojas had found the cave. But how? Either Webbles or Gugway might have found us. The Dutch told me a vampire can reach out and control an active mind, read the thoughts in the mind of an individual he connected with, and it frightened me. Chapter 12 I'd been in the cave for three days and nights. The Gugway had come twice, but we'd killed or driven these ape-like monsters away. I was sure the Webbles were around trying to find a weakness in our defences but it's hard to dig through rock. In one of Tim Grady's wagons, we found a small keg of black powder. I knew we could construct a crude bomb out of the empty bottles by mixing the powder with nails, small rocks, and anything that we could find, which would be useful as shrapnel. And one of the ladies, a cousin of Tim Grady, brought a cotton shirt which was too small for anyone to wear, and asked if it would make a good fuse. We were getting ready to fight. I was getting anxious for Henry Anglin and some of his boys to get to us. We needed help and supplies, and so I had decided to ride out and search for them. Chapter 13 Let's get straight into that. I rode out on December 2nd, 1889. Out of the cave, I rode alone. My 4570 loaded with one in the chamber, my Colt 45 in my holster, and another stuck inside my waistband. I carried grain for banjo. Venison for Jerry, cornbread, and coffee. If I had a chance to eat, an Arkansas toothpick lay in the sheath on my left side. I rode slowly, watching and listening for the sounds of Gugwe or werewolves. I didn't really know if Rojas could read minds unless he was close, but I was gambling that he couldn't and wouldn't know unless he stood outside the cave and tried to connect. I hadn't told anyone of my plans. I just told everyone I was going to search for fresh meat, and then... 
I headed out. I hated to deceive everyone, but it was best if no one knew where I was really headed. On my second day out, I heard the unmistakable sound of cattle being driven, the wagons creaking, and the sound of drivers urging the cattle and wagons onward. I topped a ridge and saw Henry Anglin on his big palomino and a Choctaw leading the way. Henry spotted me on that ridge and pointed towards me. He left the Choctaw and headed my way. It took him a bit to reach me, but he did. He asked me simply, Dodge and Annie okay? Uh, they were when I left. We had to abandon the original camp. Uh, the Choctaw, he said that would be the case when he was sent to get me. Uh, what exactly are we up against, Morgan? Uh, no account, good for nothing, vampire Henry. Uh, vampire, you say? Well, you don't seem surprised. Uh, I studied in Europe, Morgan. Visited some haunted woods and heard of such a creature in the Carpathian mountains. A nobleman of some sort. Can't recall his name. I stick clear of his lands. Ah, uh, but this one, Victor Rojas. Ah, uh, the gunfighter. Wouldn't surprise me. Well, let's get this movable caravan to your new camp. I'm anxious to see my shiftless brother and his woman. And the rest of that day found me helping to get the cattle, spare horses, and supply wagons over the ridge from where I spotted them. Henry had a steer butchered the day before, and he fed me the first beef steak I had in weeks. And over his campfire, he discussed what he knew, according to what his European professors had taught him. A vampire could and could not do. Their strengths and weaknesses. And most importantly, how to destroy them. And since they were actually reanimated corpses, they were technically dead already. And so you had to destroy the body. Destroy the body? I knew what had to be done now. Bullets were going to deter him. That was the reason he could be shot so many times and never suffer a wound. Why everyone said they saw him take bullets and yet walk away unharmed. Direct sunlight to him, or it was fatal. Darkness was his mistress, a box of his native land, in which to rest his mother's bosom. I told Henry I thought I knew where his hiding place was, and how for the werewolves and the Gugway were protecting him. Henry removed the ash from the end of his cigar. He looked thoughtfully at me. Morgan, I have an idea. Well, it's bold and it's dangerous. You'll need all your nerve. And... and he paused. Well, you and a lot of the others might die if it doesn't work. Well, lay it out for me, Henry. Well, Henry Anklin poured us both a cup of coffee. It was a bold and dangerous plan, but I was game. Chapter 14 Let's... Get straight into that. The next afternoon we arrived at a cave. Dutch met us at the entrance and filled us in. Rojas had appeared at the entrance, looking for me. Dutch had told him I'd gone hunting for fresh meat. He didn't believe him. He wanted to come into the cave and see for himself. Dutch told him no. And he had begun screaming my name, demanding that I come out of the cave and face him man to man, fight him with pistols. Dutch told him once again that I wasn't around but he was sure I'd give him satisfaction at my convenience. That was the plan Henry told his younger brother. Morgan Stuart Dawson planned to give Vincent Rojas complete satisfaction. I mounted a fresh horse and headed out. In my saddlebags were a surprise for Rojas, Webbles and the Face Eaters. Four of the Choteau rode with me, and they carried bows and arrows on with their rifles and bowie knives. We rode quietly in the snow, closer we got to where I suspected Rojas was resting, in his coffin, the higher the wind howled. We were continually changing our approach, which would take us upwind from his sanctuary. And just before dark, the werewolves began stretching their forms, standing on back legs. Two good ways stood on either side of the entrance of the cave to Rojas' sanctuary. And then Rojas and the stallion appeared. He mounted up upon the horse, gave a peculiar whistle, and werewolves and good way began following him. We watched and waited, and I checked my pocket watch to determine when we would stabilize the earth in his coffin. Hours seemed to pass. I lit a torch and entered the cave with one of the charter. I spied the wooden coffin and approached it. And the lid was off, and yeah, the legends were true. An entire coffin filled with the dirt from Spain, Mexico, or wherever he originally came from. The Chateau handed me two wooden crosses from my saddlebags. 
I scooped some of the dirt back and planted one cross beneath the soil it'd have to lay in. The second cross, I placed it on top of the soil after I smoothed the soil covering the hidden cross. Then I prayed over them and asked God to bless them. You speak well, Mr. Dawson. I hope the next part goes as smoothly. I took my saddlebags and removed several sticks of dynamite. I placed two sticks inside the coffin and ran a fuse long enough to burn ten minutes. Henry's plan was to blow the cave, destroy the coffin, and to do it near dawn. If fire was successful, he'd have no sanctuary to flee to except our cave, and they'd blow it in after full daylight. My Choto help each took a cigar and matches, and I positioned them up higher on safe rocks, divided the remaining dynamites among them, and wished them good fortune. I checked my watch. Dawn was about thirty minutes away and I quietly prayed for bright sunlight out to the east, then led the fuses to the explosives and took cover. Chapter 15 The explosion rocked the ridge the cave had been on. Dust and debris filled the air. I heard the howls of both Gugwe and the werewolves, and I heard the curses of Victor Rojas as he galloped into view. He spotted me leaning lazily against the boulder, my forty-five seventy lying in the crook of my left arm, and his black eyes bored into mine. In the distance, another huge explosion could be heard. But I just jerked his head around and looked back from the direction he and his monstrous army had come from. Nowhere to run, Rojas, I said with a bit of smugness. My children will tear you limb from limb. As if I willed it, the Choctaw men began throwing sticks of dynamite among the Gugwe and the werewolves. The screams of fear and torment from the creatures echoed through the Kiermichis. Rojas leapt off his horse and pointed a glove finger at me and told his horse, Kill him, Diablo! The horse pawed the ground, reared, and I tossed a stick of dynamite, which exploded directly underneath him. Flesh flew everywhere, and Rojas screamed, telling me that I was going to die. His anger was so great he failed to see what I was watching. His back was towards the eastern skies. The sun was rising behind him. Ah, you figure yourself a fast gun, Rojas. Let's find out. Any time, vampire. Rojas was confident. I'm much faster, Dawson. Nope. You're just a no-account, shiftless, blood-sucking vampire. I'm not sure why, but he drew. He was fast. His first bullet struck the rock I was standing in front of. His second hit the ground in front of me. I fired my forty-five Colt and began my walk towards him, firing as I advanced. When my pistol was empty, I brought my forty-five seventy up out of my left hand and began firing it from the hip. But Rojas was jerking as each bullet tore into his reanimated corpse. The last I fired literally spun him around, and he screamed as the full sunlight enveloped him. He fell to his knees, and he was on fire, and slowly turned into dust. He managed one last look at me and turned to ashes in front of my eyes. The killer known as Rojas, or he, was destroyed. I sat down on the snow-covered ground. I destroyed a vampire. I heard horses coming and looked out to see Dutch and Henry angling. Let's go home, Morgan. Home? <laughs> what a beautiful word. Chapter 16 Henry and his crew moved the Grady family to Camp Anglin. There we all stayed through the winter. Olivia, being Olivia, asked upon meeting Anglin patriarch, Abraham. Mister, are you a low-down, shiftless, no-good drifter? And Abraham smiled and said, I am, young woman, I am. Would you like to have a horse of your own? Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one, wow. Back with a tremendous bang. It got me craving biscuits and gravy all over again. The mighty Mr. David Holly. A huge thank you, David, for your return to the show and your patience over the last few weeks in letting me get this one ready and out for the folks. Also a big thank you to Sherry, as I know behind every strong man is an even stronger woman. Really is great to have you back on the channel, brother. And of course, I really hope you enjoyed this rendition. We can't wait to dive headfirst into your upcoming Tales of Adventure. 
Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help both the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you think you can pen a story pack in that much punch, then why not get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you're all well and happy. Certainly doing a lot better than myself with chest infections for the last seven days. And I hope your friends and family are doing well and looking forward to a wonderful Christmas together. Above all guys, I hope you're all keeping fit and focused and taking a fight back to life. And remember, be safe, not sorry. I rode out with my rifle at the ready. Rojas has thrown on Olivia. If the stories I read were wrong, if the stories I'd read were wrong, several of the men took axes and saws and began cutting young trees, having them into the campsite with portholes had been dug. Several of the men took axes and saws and began cutting young trees, young trees. Several of the men took axes and saws. The second rider was of slight build. Olivia looked to the rider. Fuck you. And I was beside myself, but why should I have expected a cold-blooded hide? And I was beside myself, but why should I have expected a cold-blooded hide? Fuck. And I was beside myself, but why should I expect it a cold-blooded hired gun to hand? And I was beside myself, but why should I have expected a cold bu- Fuck! The adults began bunching their teams closer together. Mine included- Mine included! Mine included! Mine included! Victor Rojas had been a surprise showing up out of the darkness in a heavy thunderstorm. He was quiet and a spooky killer. No one really knew much about him except he seemed to live a charmed life. Several who claimed to have seen him hit a suddenly 